Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, it's my pleasure to welcome Typhoon Elmas here. Uh, Typhoon is a student, a graduate student at uh, Koch University in Istanbul, Turkey. He has been an intern at MSR for two summers, and he is doing his PhD on uh, uh, program verification uh, with a focus on uh, uh, developing uh, new techniques and tools to make uh, verification of concurrent programs easier. And he's going to tell us about his uh, uh, some preliminary uh, work on his PhD dissertation today. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Tayfun Elmas from Koç University in Turkey. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is a joint work with Shaskadi and Sadat Tashan. Um, the, this talk is about proving concurrent programs correct. I mean, statically proving the programs correct. And <clears throat> the main challenge in proving a concurrent program is reasoning about interactions between threads on the shared memory. And while writing the proof, at every point, one needs to think about the, inter the interleavings of conflicting operations, right? And the existing methods deal with the interference between threads uh, and prove the concurrent programs at the finest level of granularity. At this level of granularity, Threads contain small atomic actions, and there are a large number of possible interleavings to consider. And while pro proving the program at this level, you are forced to think about concurrence and data facts at the same time. And this makes the proof difficult and complicated. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about a new static verification method for concurrent programs we call QED. And QED is supported by software tools to mechanize the proof. And the central idea in our proof is using atomicity as the main proof tool. And we have two goals in the verification. First, you write assertions in the source code, and we verify that these assertions will never get violated. And assertions, adding assertions to programs is a common way of expressing many concurrent correctness criteria. And the second one is, oh, sorry. We also reason about clean states of the program, which means if no thread is running, we want to prove some properties about these states. For example, when the program ends, what's correct about the program? Like the list is sorted, for example. And OK, this is my outline. Um, first, I'm going to talk about what's the actual problem with uh, the existing uh, methods that are used to prove concurrent programs. And I will briefly talk about QED's proof strategy. And then I'm going to talk about reduction and abstraction by giving simple examples, what the, how they are used in our method. And then in a larger example, I will talk about how reduction and abstraction, the main techniques that we use in the uh, proof, interact with each other in a larger example. And then I'm going to talk about proving uh, programs using tactics which are uh, coarser grained proof commands that we use in our implementation. And I'm going to talk about ex our experience with existing programs. Okay, now I'm going to start uh, telling you about what's the problem with the existing methods, or what, what it is difficult to prove a concurrent program. Okay, um, take this example for example. This is about, this is a simple example in which there's a uh, global variable x, and we initialize x with 0. Then we create two threads. Each of them uh, x use a common lock, acquires lock, and increments x by 1 using a local variable t. This thread is the same. And at the end, we assert that x is equal to 2. And there's two possible executions for this thread, because uh, each one acquires lock before accessing x. So Either the first thread gets executed or the second one. And the result is always equal to 2. But uh, so although that, uh, if you are looking at the example, you can obviously see the assertion will never get violated. While proving this program, it requires proof annotations at every interleaving point. 
the, uh, the reason is you need to propagate facts about data and concurrency while proving the program. And this results in complicated annotations. The annotations are complicated because uh, for each interleaving point, an annotation should express what's true when the thread comes uh, at a location. For example, here, you need to talk about uh, what's true when you get to here. And this not only talks about the local state of the thread, but also states of other threads. For example, this says, if the other thread is at L0, x is 0. And if the other thread is at L5, which means the, this one is at L5, x is 1. And also, I'm also holding the lock, and t is equal to x. So the annotations talk about global state. And talking about global state requires using facts about concurrence and data at the same time. And this results in complicated proofs. Um, now I'm go going to tell, tell you about what's our proof strategy to simplify the proofs. Okay, uh, we discussed that proving the program in, in in its initial form is difficult because the, you need to reason about program at the finest level of granularity. Instead, what we do is we transform the program to another program. Let's say P n and say P one is our initial program, P n is our final program after the transformation. And the property of PN is PN has larger atomic actions. By the way, uh, I'm going to call, action, call atomic statements as actions. So PN has larger atomic actions, and each of these large actions establishes all the facts, all the sufficient facts that are required to prove the assertions within the uh, action locally. That means uh, we prove the assertions in PN by sequential reasoning within the atomic action without worrying about concurrence and interference. And while uh, transforming the program, we also keep updating a program invariant. And our proof strategy is transforming the program like this and certifying, so reasoning about the initial program, the properties of the initial program, by analyzing the last program. And analyzing the last program is easier. And we transform the program in a number of steps. And each step is governed by a QED proof rule. And each proof rule guarantees that at each step, the assertion violations in the previous, in the, new, in the current uh, program are all preserved in the new program. So you don't lose assertion violations while transforming the program. And each QED proof rule either updates the invariant, which is actually strengthens the invariant, or transforms the program and a program is transformed as an application of reduction or abstraction. And in this talk, I'm going to demonstrate that by alternating the use of abstraction and reduction steps, we can keep increasing the atomicity up to the desired level so that we can prove the assertion sequentially. Now, uh, I'm, I want to briefly talk about our soundness theorem. And for this, I'm going to define an abstraction relation between two programs, okay? So this is the notation for abstraction relation. And we say that P1 is abstracted by P2 from I, which means for every state S1, which satisfies the invariant, actually this is an invariant usually, satisfies I, okay? And if P1 goes from S1 to S, if there's an execution of P1, this goes from S1 to S, then there exists an execution of P2 that goes from the same initial state to R. And the second condition states that if there's an execution of P1 that goes from S1 to S2, then there exists either an execution of P2 that, that goes to the same state or that goes to R. That means uh, P2 is allowed to go wrong more often than P1. And R Preservation, preservation theorem states that at each proof step, the, the new program after the transformation abstracts the initial one, the, the, the program before the transformation, from the second invariant. And our soundness theorem states that after each proof, the final prog actually, after a sequence of proof steps, the last program abstracts the 
initial program from the last invariant. And if we consider the abstraction relation, this means that if the final program has no assertion violations, then the initial program has, cannot have assertion violations from the last invariant. So this gives us uh, the condition that if we verify the final program, we certify the initial program correct. Because we always preserve the uh, assertion violations. Now I'm going to talk about uh, two techniques that we use in our proofs, reduction and abstraction. And I'm going to start from reduction. So I'm going to talk about how reduction can be used in the previous example that I showed you. And here, I also extracted the code in threads uh, to another procedure, which increments x. It's the same code. And what we do is we use the TRF uh, movers and check and determine which actions correspond to which movers. I'll talk about movers in a few slides. But here, uh, the thing is, we, uh, in deduction, we combine mover actions with other actions and get larger actions, OK? And here we don't actually uh, attempt to prove any property, but we just combine blocks to larger blocks. And this is actually our rule for uh, reducing sequential composition. And we get this larger block by uh, combining movers. And basically, a right mover can be merged with the next action, and the left mover can be merged with the previous action. And B stands for both left and right movers. And, and what is your rule? So, uh, OK. Like if it's R, L, B, Bs, you can make one big block? Yes. Basically, this is uh, an iterative process. Our rule says if alpha and gamma, for, sorry, alpha and beta comes in the program one after the other, if alpha is either right mover or beta is a left mover, we can combine these two. So we combine these iteratively. We first merge this with this one, and then it becomes right mover. And then we merge it with this one, this one. So actually, at every step, we merge two actions together. But uh, so with right mover, it, it's a down mover here, right? Yes, yes. Um, what, what does it mean? That like you cannot put t equals x before the acquire, right? It would make a different program. You cannot put t. It means right moving from, uh, with respect to uh, actions of other threads. So if, yeah. for example, between the acquire lock and t gets sex, there were other actions by other threads, then he's talking about moving the acquire oh. with respect to it's, those actions. Oh, okay. Actually, I will come to that uh, explanation in a few slides. Oh, OK. okay. This is what we are doing. Okay. So we, we are computing the movers, and we are merging movers with other actions and getting bigger blocks. And then we actually simplify this, like here, x gets x, x, get x plus 1. And then we inline uh, the body of ink in main. And at this point, we can also prove that uh, each atomic block in each thread is a bot mover with respect to other actions. Actually, this is a bot move with respect to this one. So we can, uh, using a, another rule, we can uh, reduce this parallel statement to a sequential statement and get this code, which is sequential and easy to verify. And when we verify this program and assertion, we can talk about the assertion in the initial program. OK. So uh, here's a simple explanation of uh, uh, why, the, why mo uh, merging action movers with other actions is sound, OK? So the, the rule is actually uh, as follows. If alpha and gamma comes in the program one after the other, and alpha is a right mover, we can combine alpha with gamma and get a larger block, OK? And this is the explanation, basically. Take an execution of the program before reduction in which alpha and gamma are separated by actions of other threads. So betas are actions of other threads. And if alpha is a right mover, that means we can commute, we can swap alpha with beta 1 and get an equivalent execution. And we can keep commuting 
alpha with other betas to the right until we get to gamma and we get an execution in which alpha and gamma appears together. And while swapping, at each step, we have an equivalent execution. All these executions are equivalent. And for assertion checking, you can look at any of them. And the program after reduction gives you the last execution. So we only analyze this last execution, but uh, reason about the other executions of the previous program. Like for your acquire lock, oh, yeah. these look different. Equal, yeah. Because you're acquiring a lock at a different time, right? Yeah, e equivalent mean uh, including this same set of uh, actions and going to the same final state from the same initial state. Same set of actions, but not necessarily in the same order? What, what is that? Mean? Yes, in the same order. Basically, you are changing the execution. You are changing the interleaving of the threads, but again, going to the same final state. The principle the acquire lock. It's not a right mover, right? Because one of these betas could be also acquire lock. The, the point is, two acquires cannot come together in an execution. That means, no. If alpha is an acquire lock, beta will not be an acquire lock. It could be Can a acquired lock, but of a different lock. Yeah, basically. If it would be an acquired lock, could you go to error? No, it would just no. block, right? This yeah. We are assuming that this is a valid execution, right? In a valid execution, you can't have acquired the same lock happen twice, one after another. That's why. Okay. Ah, that's why. So there's, there's some valid execution means it will never it will terminate. Yes, that's what that's my question. Valid execution. <clears throat> I mean, a valid execution means that you know, from this transition can be followed by this transition. It's all state based, right? So if you if one thread doesn't acquire action, then the state changes. Now in that state, another acquire of the same lock cannot happen. It's just the semantics of the acquire action. So valid execution means that each transition is oh, following right. its semantics. Yeah, well, it's there, I think there is a subtlety about moving locks to the right, and that's mm -hmm. the case if you have a deadlock in execution. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, in this example, say alpha is an acquire lock, mm -hmm. but actually deadlocks, then gamma never happens. Yes. So you can't actually move alpha and gamma into one time execution. Alpha is an acquire that deadlocks. How yes. will it deadlock? Because there is another set that already holds the lock and never releases it. No, but then alpha but, cannot happen, right? Alpha also happened in this execution. But it's trying to happen. OK. Uh, there is an issue. There is a subtle issue here. This is assuming that there is no uh, try, try lock operation. OK. Yeah. But no, OK. Let's change it. Let's say gamma is the acquirer. OK. Right? okay. Alpha is a left mover that comes before the acquirer. So now gamma is never happening. No, so alpha, alpha is a left mover or alpha is a right mover? Alpha is a right mover. Right mover, okay. okay. And um, you have an execution where alpha is happening and writing some state, but gamma never happens because it blocks. Yeah. And dead locks. Okay. So now you have an execution where you don't have an atomic occurrence of alpha and gamma, even though alpha is a right mover. So I think the issue is that we are only trying to preserve final states. So if a thread blocks, then there is no guarantee that, that block, the state in which it blocks is going to be preserved. Yeah. That's true. So we preserve final states and we preserve assertions. Yeah, only the final states. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you tend to only look at derivations that lead to a particular state. Yes. You take all those derivations. So yes. All the others are just not, not relevant to you. Yeah. yeah. Even though they might be possible. But right. Yeah, we go to the same that. state and we preserve the assertions. Yeah, so it's something like uh, you prove something, yeah, that the assertion holds if, you know, you don't take prove anything about termination, basically. There may yes. be divergent things that are yes. just yes. not considered. Yes, yes. This is partial. Yeah. Um, 
By the way, I also hide something here that says um, by our rules, while swapping alpha with other actions, if you somehow go to edge, that's still fine. Because I will show you the rule here. So uh, we said how we reason about alpha being right mover, but uh, this is how we check that alpha is the right mover. And we check alpha is the right mover statically. Basically, what we do is we take alpha and we take all actions, beta, in the program and do a pairwise check. What we check is whether basically alpha followed by beta is abstracted by beta followed by alpha. That means beta followed by alpha when we swap, so here, when we swap beta with alpha, it can go to the same state or go to error. It's still okay. Okay, this is how we check uh, movers in our implementation, basically. So why is it okay? Because it's okay, it's kind of incomplete, right? So what, um, why is it okay to have error state, right? Because the thing is, we don't care whether um, you add more assertions or not, because uh, it's a game. I mean, you want to prove the program. If somehow prove your program using deduction and abstraction in, uh, by our steps, we guarantee that the initial program has no assertions. But you may not be able to prove it. So think about it this way. I mean, by having an, a random error in there, you only make things hard, harder for yourself, right? Because the goal is to prove the final program correct. It is not going to affect the, affect the soundness of the result, yeah, right? That's right. But the sound is still the same. Yeah. Right. And the nice the thing is that you know when you're reasoning locally about two actions, you might conclude that if I move this one alpha to the right of beta, it might go wrong. But globally, it might not happen, right? Because of the state in which, if you look at the entire program, so you might want to do that, even if locally you know it goes wrong. Because later on, when you consider global executions, then actually it won't. That error is not going to happen. Okay. Okay, so, so I showed the mover check, and there are two simple cases for this mover check. First is, if alpha x and beta access different variables, the check passes trivially. And if the check fails, if alpha and beta are simultaneously enabled, and they perform conflicting accesses to a variable, that means, Actually, if they are simultaneously enabled and there's interference between them, the check fails. Now I'm going to talk about uh, abstraction in our technique. And I will continue with our increment example, but now I'm going to implant the increment using a CAS operation. Basically, what we are doing here is in a loop, we are reading x and then we are uh, in a case, we are checking that if x, if x is still the same, and if it is the same, we replace it with t plus. So we read x to t, and if x is the same, I mean there's no uh, right to x between these two blocks, then we write t plus 1 to x and break. And as long as t changes between these two blocks, we keep trying again and again. And we have the same main program, so this is how case is implemented. It's an atomic uh, operation. If x equals t, x gets t plus 1 and it turns to else nothing changes and it turns false. Okay, now I'm going to rewrite the program uh, so that there's no break in while. Basically what, we are d what I'm doing is uh, I'm, in, I'm only leaving the unsuccessful, unsuccessful iterations within the loop and hoisting the successful iteration after the loop. So this is the one that fails, always assuming that x not equals to t, and this is the one that succeeds, that assumes t gets, x gets t and increments x by one. Okay, now the problem here is if you want to reduce this uh, procedure into a single action, there's an interference between uh, there's interference between these operations, the read of x 
and this action that writes to x. And we will not be able to prove that these actions are movers because the lead of x is not protected. Now what we are going to do now is actually uh, considering the fact that these leads of x are not important for the correctness of the algorithm. Basically what we are doing is uh, actually the last uh, atomic action is important for correctness. It just increments x by 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add non-deterministic behavior to this program so that deduction can combine more, co can prove more mover actions and combine more movers with actions. So here, what we do is we apply a simulation rule. Actually, this is a rule in our proof. And this actually does abstraction. I'm going, going to abstract the lead of x to, to t to have a t, which basically uh, non-deterministic deletes any value instead of reading the value of x. And this one is also similar. You use non-deterministic x. And actually, havoc t is both mover because it's a local variable. You are just assigning non-deterministic value a top local variable. And there's another read here. Assume x gets t. And I also abstract it by abstracting assume x not equals t to skip. Basically, this one blocks if x is not equal to t, but, but this one never blocks. And basically, we are adding more behaviors. And in this case, all these actions are board movers. Because this is just skip, and these are have a t to a local variable. And we can combine them with other blocks using reduction. And when we get the, while loop, the body of while loop as a single action, we can also reduce it to a single action without loop to havoc t. This is basically havoc t. And we get an execution in which uh, there's havoc t, havoc t, x gets x plus 1. And basically, we combine this one with the next action, and we get the uh, atomic action that gives us uh, the operation that x is incremented by 1. So you see that we used abstraction, which is adding uh, more non-deterministic behavior to actions to make them movers and combine them with other actions. And we don't change the, we don't change the correctness arguments. So uh, this is our abstraction rule. Basically, it's similar to uh, the relation is similar to what I showed in Salmon's theorem. So our abstraction rule allows us to replace an action, alpha, with another action, beta, if alpha is abstracted by beta from i. i is usually the current invariant of the program. And it states that it's similarly from all the states that satisfies invariant. If alpha goes to error from a state, beta should go to error from the same state. And if alpha goes from S1 to S2, then beta should either go to S2, the same state, or should go to S. That means we are allowing the new action to go along more often. Basically, we are adding more assertion violations, possibly adding more assertion violations. And this is sound for assertion checking. So as I said before, there are um, two types of abstractions that we use in our programs. I'll show the first one in the previous example, which is done by adding non-determinism. For example, here, uh, this one executes y gets y plus 1 if x is equal to 1. And we make it non-deterministically executed. And these are examples from our previous example that we abstracted the read of x, and we abstracted the assumption to skip. And there's another kind of uh, abstraction in which uh, not, we don't add non-determinism, but we add uh, more erroneous behaviors, possible erroneous behaviors to the program. And we allow the action to go along more often. For example, here, the action is x gets x plus 1, and we make it to fail if x is equal to 0. That means the new action may go along more often, but that's still OK. And another way of uh, abstracting the action is adding assertion. 
which basically causes the, causes the action to go along more often. Like in this case, we are asserting that x is not 0. And actually, uh, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to give an example to this, case, this kind of abstraction, how we do abstraction and health reduction by adding assertions. And this will be about borrowing assertion, assertions example. OK. So um, this example is about a sorted linked list. And um, the list is accessed concurrently using hand over hand locking. Uh, we want to prove local assertions within the procedures. And also, we want to prove that when there's no thread is executing, the list is sorted. For example, at the end of the program, the list is sorted. And proving this property is difficult because uh, pro procedures use fine-grained locking. That means a procedure locks only the no nodes that it's currently using. That means more than one thread can work on this list at the same time. Okay, And I'm going to concentrate on the insert procedure. Uh, this is how insert works. Basically, suppose that insert is called with 5. And 5 should be inserted for this list between 4 and 7. And uh, the nodes P and N refer to previous and next nodes for the new node. So uh, find calls find, uh, sorry, insert procedure calls find at the beginning. And find locks P and returns it to insert. And insert creates uh, the, new, the new node P and inserts it between P and N. So this is the code for insert. Uh, here, each box again denotes a separate uh, atomic action. P, T, and N are local references to nodes, so that when you uh, use that notation, you are referencing to a global uh, variable. So P insert first calls find and gets P. Then uh, the new node is created and assigned to T. And the uh, fields of the new node is, are initialized. And at this point, t, t is thread local. But here, uh, the new node is added to the list by setting p.next to t. At this point, t is in the list. And we assert that, uh, actually, I simplified the assertion, this one, to ptn are sorted. Basically, we are checking that uh, the set of nodes that we are currently using are sorted at this point. And then uh, at the end, insert unlocks p before exiting. Unlocks uh, p was locked by find at the beginning. OK. Now, the programmer of this code would like to reason about the assertion as if the code is sequential. This is because once you take the invariant that the list is sorted, uh, sequentially verifying the assertion is simple. But in order to be able to reason sequentially, the programmer uh, must ensure that there's no interference on this code and the code is atomic. And in fact, this is the case because there are two reasons for this. The first reason is the node P is locked at the beginning by find and unlocked at the end. So P was on, always locked while the code is executing. Second, when t is created for these three nodes, these three uh, actions, t is thread local, so nobody accesses it. And after, even after it's added to the list, it's still unaccessible by other threads because the previous node is still locked until the end. So there's no interference on the nodes p and t, and also even n. So the code, is at, code uh, works automatically. So this was the programmer's reasoning. And having explained the programmer's reasoning, this is how we prove the program in QED. We actually mimic the programmer's reasoning. What we do is we start from the initial program and transform the program to another program in which insert appears atomic. And we prove the assertion uh, sequentially by using an invariant that list is sorted. And while transforming the program, we exactly use the three arguments of the programmer that I described in the previous slide. And this style of proof gives us separation of concerns because while transforming the program, we only concentrate on concurrence effects. 
And at the end, we prove the data facts sequentially without worrying about concurrency and interference. And these transformations are guided by a proof script in our implementation. And the commands in the proof script uh, apply QED proof rules in order to transform the program. So basically, the transformations are guided by the user, but mechanized by the implementation. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to concentrate on a step in which uh, uh, we start from the program on the left. This is the version of the program after we transform the body of find procedure into a single action and inline it in insert here. I'm not going to show how we transform the body of find, but we use the same key steps that I will show you in this talk. So I'm, I'm not going to show these uh, steps, but I'm start from this uh, version. So at this point, we apply deduction to get bigger blocks. And for this program, uh, this action is a right mover, and this action is a left mover. So as I told you before, right mover can be combined with, with the next one, and left mover can be combined with the previous one and we get the program on the right, okay? And at this point, when we reach the program in the middle by doing reduction, the reduction gets stuck. And it cannot combine more uh, actions because no one will check passes at this point. And I'm going to show what happens by having a closer look at a mover check. Okay? Now, uh, in this slide, the actions alpha and beta are uh, taken from the body of insert, okay? And we are checking that alpha can be committed to the right of beta. For this check, there are two cases. The first case is if P's in thread A and thread P, thread B, refer to different nodes, there's no interference between alpha and beta because they access different nodes. And the second case is more interesting because if P's in B, thread A and B refer to the same node. There is an apparent interference between alpha and beta because they're accessing the same node. And they're doing conflicting operations. But the fact is, when we look at where these actions are executed in the program, in the body of insert, we will see that when the actions are executed, alpha and beta are both locked. Sorry, uh, P's in alpha and beta are both locked. That means, if they're accessing the same node, these actions cannot be simultaneously enabled at the same time. And we, are, we don't have this information because we are considering alpha and beta locally without looking at where they are executed. But we are just taking alpha and beta and doing a local check. And the solution would be adding uh, information about the global fact that P's are locked within the actions. And we add this information using Assertions. As I told you before, adding assertions is a sound abstraction because we are just causing the action to go wrong more often, possibly. And here, uh, the explanation is, we are supposing that lock and unlock operations are implemented using an owner variable. And owner P gives us the idea of the thread that acquired the lock of P. And during the check, these assertions will indicate that P's are locked by threads A and B, and also the fact that they are locked by different threads. That means, while these, uh, if alpha and beta are simultaneously enabled, P's cannot uh, refer to the same node. So we the assertions indicate that there's no interference between alpha and beta, and the check passes. And assertions are not only used for simple mechanisms like locks, but they can be used for other complicated mechanisms. For example, here, um, alpha is accessing a thread local node, T. This is actually taken also from the body of insert. Alpha is uh, accessing a thread local node, which is not in the list currently, and beta is accessing a uh, node, which is in the list. And to indicate this fact, we use an auxiliary variable in list. In list gives us whether the node is in the list or not. And we add assertions to indicate this fact. And during the mover check, these assertions indicate that T is in the list and P not, is not. So T and P cannot refer to the same node. So we actually prevent a, a, 
a pen interface caused by an caused by an aliasing issue. And in this case, the mobile check again passes. Okay. Now, um, the program on the left is after we added all the assertions that I talked about. And we also annotate the actions to indicate, to specify how these auxiliary variables are modified by the actions, but I will not show them in the figure. And by the use of these assertions, a subsequent deduction step gives us the atomic body of insert on the left. Okay? And when we get the atomic body on the left, we can prove the assertions that we borrowed in the previous abstraction step using sequential analysis. And by our Sardinus theorem, this gives us the following. These assertions actually would never fail in the, last, in the left uh, program. But we didn't prove them right after adding them because it would be difficult to prove these assertions. There was interference. But uh, our Sardinus theorem allowed us to prove them sequentially later in the proof. So you, you see how deduction and abstraction steps work in a symbiotic way in our proof. Dedu abstraction allows us to uh, help deduction when it gets stuck. And deduction gi gi gives us uh, bigger atomic blocks to justify the assertion steps that we did previously. Okay, And we complete the proof by doing the deduction and getting the atomic action. And we also add the invariant that list is sorted. And another important point here is we can delay the introduction of invariants because uh, we, we will not be able to prove the invariant that list is sorted in this version of program and in this one. But when we get the uh, sequential body, we can easily prove that the invariant holds between atomic, atomic action boundaries. And using the invariant list is sorted and sequential analysis, we can prove the assertion. And this proves the result that says insert n satisfies the assertion and in states list is sorted gives us the following by the Salmon's theorem. The Salmon's theorem implies that uh, the initial program, in the initial program, if we were uh, running the program from a sorted list, the assertion would never get violated. And the second result is if there's no thread is running for the initial program, the list is sorted. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the mover, movers are in the, in the middle column that allow you to go to the right column. Can you point it out maybe? Like which, which, one's, which one is the uh, non-mover and which ones are the movers? Okay. Uh, actually, in this one, I don't show the assertions, but in this one, okay? So, um, as I said before, the deduction step is uh, iterative. So first, we prove that this is the right mover. This is the right mover. Yeah, creation of a node. And we combine it this one. Okay. And we can combine it until this one and still get the right mover, okay. these three blocks. And then, at this point, um, we prove that this is the right mover. Actually, this is a complicated analysis, but um, and then we combine it with this one, and we prove that this is a left mover. Combine it this one, okay. and yeah, so I, I mean, so I couldn't have guessed that easily. Just the, <laughs> the thing is, this is not a sim this is not the single reduction step. There, there are a couple of reduction steps, and then there also we used uh, a couple of invariants uh, about this auxiliary variable. To prove the program, I, I can. Because I look at the bottom one and I saw a sort of PTN sorted. Yeah. That looks like it's not going to be moving anytime soon. And yeah, actually, we the proved that all the all the previous ones are right, right mover, okay. basically. Okay. So um, now I'm going to briefly talk about how we prove programs in our implementation. So in our implementation, we use proof scripts and proof tactics. Basically, uh, doing the proof with core proof steps would be difficult because you, do, you may not know 
how to proceed, how to apply which assertion, which abstraction and reduction step. In, in this case, we use tactics. Basically, tactics are coarser proof steps that apply multiple proof rules for a specific purpose. For example, reduce statement command applies multiple deduction rules that includes reducing sequential statements, loops, and even procedures. And it uses heuristics. And in our implementation, we combine these tactics in proof scripts. I'm going to give you two examples of tactics. One is abstract tactic. This basically applies the simulate rule. Uh, and for example, the first one uh, abstract with x alpha. What it does is it basically transforms the action alpha so that read of x is non-deterministic at the beginning of alpha. And the second one transforms alpha so that when alpha ends, x is, x is written a non-deterministic value. And assert p alpha basically adds an assertion to an alpha. And there are more complicated tactics like mutex p x tactic. What it does is I showed before how we use the owner variable to indicate that p's are locked. And you can indicate a simple hint that, how, that indicates how the locks, how the mutual exclusion idiom is used in your program. And we can generate these assertions automatically. And this tactic basically gives to p a simple hint to the tool that indicates how the mutual exclusion is used. I'm going, and this tactic actually uh, applies three different proof rules together. I'm going to give one example. Suppose that, so uh, this was the, from our previous example that uh, implements incrementing x using a lock. And suppose that we implemented acquire and release operations with assume lock equals false, lock gets true, and lock gets false. A simple implementation. And here, the programmer would like to uh, instrument this code with auxiliary variables so that he can use deduction. What he, he does is he gives the hint that lock equals two and x. That tells uh, the tool that when, so there's a mutual exclusion idiom in the program. And the idiom is implemented so that when the lock is acquired, this predicate lock gets equals two is, becomes true. And when the lock is released, it becomes false. And the, the excesses of the variable x are all protected by this lock. And what the tactic does is, it first adds a new auxiliary variable, let's say a, and instruments acquire and release operations with a. It basically says, when a, and in addition, it adds a new invariant which says if luck is equal to two, which means if luck is acquired, A is not zero. And actually A stores the idea of the threat that acquired the luck. And it instruments acquire and release so that when luck is acquired, A is assigned TID, the current thread ID. And when it is released, A is assigned zero. And this is a valid transformation for our proof system. And then it adds assertions. So that when x is accessed, it's as the assertion that a equals to t. Basically that the lock is acquired. And also before release, we also add assertion a equals t. And using these assertions, so by the way, uh, I think these assertions is again a kind of abstraction step. And using these assertions, we can easily prove that uh, the actions that access x are both movers, acquire is a right mover, and to lease is a left mover. And by doing a reduction, uh, we get an atomic block, and we can prove all these assertions within the atomic block. Basically, because it's assigned t, and all these assertions are discharged. And this also indicates that we don't have to uh, use the previous notions of reduction that basically use acquires and release operations, the conceptual acquire and release operations as right and left movers and uh, lock protected accesses as both movers. We just use assertions to, uh, 
justify our reasoning. So we can basically adjust to any implementation of mutual exclusion and other synchronization idioms. So and um, suppose I, I write a rule thing there. Yeah. You know, mutex log equals false x. Then you will not be able to prove the assertions. Yes, but you will still always do the sound thing. Yes. So, so it, it's only a, a helpful strategy that helps you do abstraction, perhaps automatically. But you'll never be, you'll be able to derive the assertion is true just because I made a mistake in one of these. Yeah. Um, mutex declarations or So you're saying that I made a mistake in the implementation of lock and unlock, right? Or no, no, I, I'm, I'm saying if I is is it like an assume statement, right? right? Maybe is it something that you where you can if you make a mistake that I can suddenly prove it, but it's actually wrong. The problem is just wrong, and it's because my mutex declaration is wrong that I can suddenly prove it. But in or is it the case that you only use it as a you know helpful hint to to help your strategy to to prove it? You'll never prove a program correct that's actually wrong. Yeah, actually the like second one. The letter, right? Yeah, okay. it's it's just simple hints. But the thing is, that's good. <laughs> and I wasn't sure about it, right? If it could, could make a. Uh, um, the thing is, for many programs, it works. It's so it's works. because you're only adding assertions. You don't add assume statements. If you started adding assume statements, then that would that's create right. problems. Yeah, yeah. And that's why. So that means so that two cases, either we had assertions that you will never uh, prove, or we may not be able to add assertions to the places that you think that the assertions should be there, because you missed some luck, for example, for an access, so that we will not be able to add the assertion there. So I'm briefly talk about our experience with our uh, technique. Uh, we implemented our tool using Boogie, and actually an extension of Boogie as a front-end uh, input language, and we use uh, Boogie and SpecSharp front-end. Um, maybe we should skip these proofs over. So um, our proof strategy is actually flexible, and we can do proofs over unstructured programs. And we generate VCs to check premises of our proof rules and give it to Z3 theorem provers. And we can check, uh, we can mechanize the proof steps easily. Um, using our technique, we proved a bunch of uh, examples, well-known programs from the literature. These include pretty benchmarks of the programs that use fine-grained locking and also uh, number locking algorithms. I, guess. I was just wondering, when you, as you mentioned obstruction-free deck, of course, there's like the question, can you prove that it is obstruction free? Uh, no, actually, we put other properties that... Can you capture that using an assertion? I don't No, it's a liveness property. Then we can... Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But, what, um, but in that case, what about deadlock, the hand-over-hand locking, for example? Uh, I think you don't prove absence of deadlock, right? Mm. You know, right? No. And that you can capture with. Yes, but I think, yes, that's true. But I think the proof of hand over hand locking that we did, we did not put that assertion. Yes. Maybe yeah. a good thing to add automatically assertions for absence of that. Yeah, that would be good. We can do that. Mm -hmm. um, we also put non blocking algorithm, so not obstruction free DQ, non blocking stack and Baker algorithm. And for all these programs, so all these programs are written at fine granularity at fine grain concurrency. And we could be able to, uh, we were able to increase the atomicity for these programs to some level so that we could uh, prove their properties using sequential verification. So uh, this is our future work. We are currently working on adding new tactics to implementation to capture uh, other synchronization idioms, including Kudus, Artists, like Bayers, and uh, even events, and we are also working on adding new proof rules and also tactics that ha that can handle optimistic concurrency mechanisms. Um, our colleagues Sada Ali and also Shaz 
are working on verifying an STM implementation in QED using our new tactics for optimistic concurrency. And another possible path for future work is if you mark a statement as atomic, expecting that, that the code block will is serializable, can we prove it using QED? And which kind of uh, core proof rules are relevant for this proof? The, the basic thing for this is because our abstraction rule allows any code block to be abstracted, it would, it would, it would be great to see which kind of proof rules is appropriate to prove a serializability uh, check. And this is an interesting question. And I want to conclude with um, saying that we presented, in this talk we presented QED as a soundproof system that uh, uses atomicity as a proof tool to simplify the proofs and also uses reduction and abstraction in an alternating way so that we can keep increasing atomicity so that we can leverage sequential reasoning uh, appropriately. And so I think that's enough and I can take questions. So how hard is it to write proofs with this? I mean, I, I understand the idea that it's very attractive to see how it actually works, you know, on an example. Yeah. But also when I see your actual proof, it looks like, I mean, I wouldn't come up with it very easily. So, so what was your experience in how, so, how easy is it? In our experience, we actually use tactics for that. We don't directly insert assertions. We indicate which kind of uh, synchronization is used or which kind of invariant are, exist in the program. And we do it by seeing what's the current program and what are the properties of the current program. So the tool is interactive. So you do something, you increase the block, that, and then... That, that, that automation step is important. Yes. And the reduction step is important. It, it just does reduction, it, it does uh, apply reduction steps automatically. So it's very useful. So you don't have to look at which actions are right movers to reason. And actually we see the, fi so our final goal is come up with a tool that uh, provides tac very simple tactics to the programmer so that even a programmer can express his uh, thinking, his uh, justification about why the program is correct to the tool. So, yeah, okay. so when, you, when you were fleshing out these tactics, how many new tactics did you have to invent per new example, considering? Uh, not much. Not much? Yeah. Basically, the tactic for, so we invented mutual exclusion tactic to handle these right. uh, locks, and also we had to imp invent a new tactic for some, con like a barrier condition, something like uh, you're initializing an object, and after, before initialization, there's a flag that says the object is not initialized, and there's a flag that is set after the initialization, and this kind of synchronization is common. So we implemented this kind of syn synchronization as a new thing. response to that? Uh, my take is on the tactics issue is that tactics have the biggest payoff in relatively large programs in which the synchronization is, uh, consists of uh, idioms that are well understood that have been composed together. We don't have experience yet with large programs. We have experience with small and tricky programs. I think there, I think that tactics buy you a little bit, but not a whole lot. Because the individual things are so custom, custom -built. it's very hard to design a tactic for it. But for example, for large programs, which are typically not going to use these kind of crazy non-blocking things, I think tactics mm -hmm. will provide much Mostly. higher value. Right? But I think but we I need think more the, experience. I think the tactics are actually very interesting because they sort of connect to the designer's intuition of writing these things. Exactly. So as you always mm -hmm. know, you, you're sort of on the right track if, if you connect with the intention of the people who write the code. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's, that's good here. And they're also used for debugging. You apply a tactic and you expect that 
some block will be sequential because you by giving a tactic about synchronization, you expect that these blocks will get uh, like not with non-interference. You prove that there's no interference on this block because I'm giving this synchronization idiom. If there's a error in your implementation, we will not the tool will not be able to get the block, atomic block to you, and you will see that the synchronization idiom is not correctly used or implemented. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I mean, I could even I could even see that used in a in a di completely different setting where you have the tactic is. You know, it's, it's actually you give the program a way of expressing intent of how is this synchronization actually working. That's sort of a meta assertion that the tool can check. Mm -hmm. you, you're yes. trying to prove yes. it, but it could be could be dynamic, right? You can just try to check it. Yes. Yes. If it was done right. That's right. Yes. Um, two uh, remarks or requests. Or, uh, uh, one is that the on that um, issue of the, the tactics and the um, uh, expressing the programming intent. I think that is that's a very important thing to uh, for the programmers to be able to, to write down and then you know, it helps your tool as well. Um, and and there I think it'd be really great to to do comparison of the the tactics that you develop and what uh, what exists in other uh, specification languages. Uh, I mean, take Chalice for example. That uh, the uh, what you're saying here is that, that some variable is, is guarded by some predicate, like block equals true. Um, well, uh, you would express that in a particular way in, in other uh, languages. Or in Chalice, you might say that half of x uh, is protected by one lock and half of it is protected by another, for example. So doing that comparison, I think, would be really yeah. great, because you might end up with more hints here as well about what, what those other languages should have in their specifications, what contract they should use. And the other one is, um, uh, I think you have not tried event B, right? Um, tried what? Uh, event B, the, the row down tool. Um, so event B is, event B is a, um, um, is, a, is an approach to developing programs which is just the dual of what, what you're doing, it strikes me. Uh, that is, instead of you start with a program and then you abstract and abstract and abstract until you get well and then um, reduce and abstract and reduce until you get to to a program and something that's very nice in what you're doing is that that you don't have to write in variants about the complicated uh, program as for example in, in, in Chalice you have to write the, um, the invariants about the, the complicated program uh, but here you can abstract first and then write simpler invariants what you do in the event B approach is that you start from the specification and you can write invariants and things like that, specifications, and they're, and they're simple again. And then, instead of abstracting what up, you refine mm -hmm. uh, going the other way. Yep. And, um, and in fact, it's using, um, you don't use reduction directly in the sense that, I mean, you never talk about left and right movers, but all of the theorems that are, that are based, that event B is, is based on for breaking uh, larger actions into smaller atomic steps. They're all based on the same, um, all left and right movers in, the, in just the same way. Right, so they're all based on commutative, commutativity. Yes, right, exactly. Yeah. So I think what would be very interesting would be to, I mean, take a specific, specific example, I mean, take the hand over hand walking, for example, mm. and do that same thing in, um, in the, the other order. system, yeah. right? Uh, that is, do it in their system. Uh, they have an automatic tool for it. Uh, actually, um, my guess is that you would be able to use the same kind of invariants, the same sorts of things. Uh, for example, uh, as you showed on one of the slides, here you, you first, you'd like to, you just magically pick um, the right node and lock it. Um, yeah. But of course what the program does, it, it does the hand over hand locking to get there. And I think you would do something similar in, in event B, you would, you would say that what this thing does is just, it finds somehow uh, the right place and then it inserts it there. So I think that you would do this, the same or very similar steps to what you're doing, but just in the reverse order. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it um, I think that it would, I mean, if you did that in their system and really went through the proof, I think it would, it would teach us all something about uh, how these things are related and, and what's good doing it one way or uh, versus the other. Mm -hmm. uh, really valuable. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. You could imagine if you go the other way, you would have 
you know, a lot of assertions could be automatically discovered and given to you, you don't have to guess them. Mm -hmm. But then in terms of where, where do you split and how do you split, you, you kind of know less, right? right. Like if you so I think that exactly those sorts of trade-offs, I mean, if you did it the other way around with the other tool as well, I think you would notice that, oh, if you do it this way, these things are easy, but if you mm -hmm. do it the other way, these things are easy. Maybe we could think of some ways to combine them in some way. And actually, if, I, if we compare those two, I think that another advantage that those two approaches don't have that, uh, let's say, Chalice does have is that in Chalice, you, you write you have one program text at the end, and you have uh, all of the gory, uh, detailed invariants. But that means that you have, you have that one thing, and you, you shoot it to the verifier, and it says yes. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas um, you do some interactions then. Also in the uh, event B structure, what you do is you have several files that, that give you like, different versions of, mm -hmm. of the whole program with the different uh, steps. Um, which is, I mean, maybe we should all get used to having like multi-file edits, sort of like the same program. But I mean, it mean, might be very nice, but the but, but yeah, nice to that is actually a big together. issue uh, mm -hmm. for me at least because what I think one nice thing about Chalice, which is basically having a, a source code annotated with all specifications, is that if you did that mm -hmm. and you couldn't push through the static proof. Mm -hmm. You can insert runtime checks and get some checking like that. Right. Yeah. But in this approach, right, I don't quite see how to do that because the code that is going to be executed has been abstracted, and then you're partying on this abstraction. How do you connect that to this this thing? So I, I think it's a challenge actually, because I mean, from a practical so point, it's a fundamental huh? challenge, or is it just a challenge of coming up with the right syntax? Well, I mean, it's a challenge in the sense that I think you have to give enough, a significant amount of thought about how to doing it. Whereas in the case of Chalice, it's obvious what you're going to do. So, I mean, it's like you have to think more. I, mean, I don't think it's an insurmountable challenge, but uh, I mean, you'll have to work hard. But this other business about going from the abstract to the concrete, right? The proof rules here, they don't care about which direction you're going because it's always semantics preserving. Right. So you could do that here. But one thing I always worry about is that that's a very idealistic position to take that you start with the specification and refine it. Yeah. I just don't know whether it is, whether you know programmers will actually ever think that way. I find it very hard. I've because for example, this intuition. <laughs> huh? I've never seen it. <laughs> no, I mean, but, but, but you could also, right, I, and I would, um, I have some sympathy for that, but, the, but you could also argue, are programmers ever going to be able to understand uh, the specifications in Chalice or the refinements, the abstraction sure. steps you do here or anything right. Right, other than... So, but uh, a, a more realistic use of the other direction that I uh, discovered in a conversation at Popo was the following, that when you have parallelizing compilers, what they're doing is they're taking a sequential program and they are parallelizing it. And if they actually wanted to uh, generate a proof that uh, they match in semantics, then in that case, the right direction to go is from the specification to the parallel implementation. And that actually, I, I imagine it could be actually quite useful uh, from a practical point of view. The nice thing there is that, uh, first of all, uh, the compiler is doing it. And compilers typically apply local transformations, so I can imagine that they can spit out the, the site conditions that are needed to justify the steps. And also, I think uh, in that case, one of the the hardest part about uh, doing the story that I can explain was what what is the abstraction that you, you should use at any point in time to enable subsequent reduction. Now, when a compiler is trying to parallelize a program, typically they will not use abstraction at all. What they're going to do is they're going to basically reason about you know disjoint. Uh, segments that, you know, these two loop iterations or something, they're looking at different pieces of data and then they will uh, create two threads to do it. So there will not be any abstraction involved. So again, I think there it is more realistic uh, to connect uh, the transformations using a formal proof. Uh, right. So, right, so whether or not, I mean, programmers would ever pick up I mean, any of these data sets, I mean, uh, the, I think that uh, from, I mean, scientifically, it would be interesting to make a comparison. Yeah. So, um, also, you know, uh, one issue is comparing the, um, what you're doing to the going from the abstract to the concrete. Um, when you go from the abstract to the concrete, it's uh, there you have to figure out how to split the actions. But the but it's I would say it's pretty simple to do um, to do all of the checks modularly in the sense that you know all of the variables, and as you go to the concrete, you're adding more variables, but you're adding those. You, you know that no one else in the in the world is going to have your variables.
variables. You don't have to think about, is this a right to left move with respect to some parts of the program that you've never heard of? Whereas in your case, you need to make some sort of arguments to say, um, I mean, the scoping of the variables, or just hope that no one else ever touches this loss or, or whatever. So the, I mean, so that's an advantage of program I, I think there are probably many such advantages and disadvantages on the, on the flying if, if one, I mean, really did the details. What was the name of the tool again? Uh, Rodan. Uh, o R O D I N. The sculptor. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And event B is the so it's uh, it's um, uh, Claude Ramon Agrial did uh, Z, then he did B, and then he did event B. So event B is the like a concurrent version of B if you will. And Michael Butler, for example, has been quite involved in in um, using the tool.